parking tickets and leave me alone. Stick to something you know about. Listen, my daughter was about your age. Then she met a guy like you. Now she's dead. <laughs> you still believe in ghosts, P-Brain? He's a closet! This is all the whiskey you possess? Everyone out of the way of the bulldozer! Hello and welcome to Hello, This is the Doomed Show. I am Richard. Folks, I am joined by a special guest. He's a writer, a director, and he told me not to mention it. He's a secret spelunker, (laughs) but he's out now. I'm talking to Dan Wilder. Dan, hello. Hey, how's it going? Oh my god, it's better now that I'm talking to you. <laughs> yeah, I spice up any conversation. <laughs> Muy caliente. I've heard you described as such. Indeed. But no, dude, I we've been meaning we've been needing to have talked for like a long time. Yeah, I mean, we've just do the little chats on uh on Facebook, but that's just not the same. No. No, we're we're breaking out of our social media holes to climb into a different hole, I guess. Different. Yeah, exactly. It's much different. You can you can hear my voice now. That's about that's about it. Yeah, so. that's the most important part. So, mm-hmm. folks, if you don't know Dan, we're going to talk about all the things that Dan does do. Uh, let's get into uh, your your filmmaking, dude. Because like I have been lucky enough to review one of your films or have i reviewed two now i think just one yeah you uh i think you reviewed uh ouija room which used to be called haunting inside but they when you know when a distributor gets a hold of things they change the titles i reviewed that and the short i reviewed mercury screens yes thank you i was always really impressed because (laughs) i of course have tried to make films like Mm -hmm. And the longest film I made was 28 minutes. And the reason it was 28 minutes, because there was no script and every scene was just us talking until the idea that I basically laid out got communicated. Mm -hmm. And then we moved on, which meant um, long takes, long takes with the, uh, the video camera audio taking, just capturing all that magic of uh, (laughs) a bunch of librarians uh, just talking, because of course everyone in my movie was a librarian. But it's I find filmmaking very difficult in that I feel guilty for wasting everyone else's time because you you have friends and you have like or people even worse people you barely know hanging out for sixteen hours so they can say a line. How do you how do you yeah. deal with <laughs> with that kind of like that kind well, of nightmare? Well, uh, it, it's situational for sure. Uh, the short that you reviewed, Mercury Screams, and we'll get we'll get back to that later. If there's more to say about that, um, that was filmed in about four hours. Uh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Here's the deal: we filmed it at, at uh, my in-laws' house, Caitlin's parents' house, my wife, Caitlin, um, and they were moving in, uh, so we had that amount of time to shoot what we were going to shoot and get the hell out of it. <laughs> before the moving so, van arrived. Uh, yeah. It was awesome. It was supposed to be a 50 degree day. It was 28. Um, wow. I had, you know, this poor girl lying fully nude on the floor of the house with no heat. Oh, jeez. Um, and then I ran her around outside in a sundress. So I felt like the world's biggest asshole. <laughs> uh, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, I directed a film uh, called Babysitter Massacre Heavy Metal. It is yes. going to be third in the Babysitter Massacre series by uh, Henrik Koto. And that's not out yet, but we made it pre, uh, pre-COVID, pre-pandemic. And that's that was the exact opposite. Like, I had people show up in the morning and they weren't even going to film until the end of the day. So when they're just sitting around, uh, I put their asses to work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I make them, you know, help with costumes, help with makeup, nice. help me get craft service i make all the food uh when i make a movie uh because one it's economical and two home-cooked meals people respond to that you know it's not just a freaking 
cardboard pizza in a box, you know. <laughs> here's your here's your freaking Domino's, and I get back to work. Because you're asking a lot of some people, um, especially in the horror genre. You've got people sitting around dressed up as monsters. You got people sitting around getting ready for effects. You got people sitting around. You know, getting ready to lay naked on a 28 degree floor. You got all sorts of wacky stuff going on, but you just kind of make the best of it. But I, I feel that since we are ultra low budget independent features, if you're on set, you pretty much know you're going to get wrangled into doing some some job. So you did the third Babysitter Massacre. Yes. Uh, were you involved with the other two or is this this was you were uh, lucky enough to kind of like step in to go crazy Um, with the third one well uh henrik is my friend uh from a while back uh he first contacted me to write a script on spec for uh a feature for itn releasing that never got it just never came together it just Mm. never got me so he's like well let's make a movie we can make real quick i want it set in a house you know he gave me the basics and that became haunting inside which is which is uh Ouija Room, which you can watch on Amazon or whatever. Or don't oh, watch yeah. it at all. I don't give a fuck what you do. But uh, <laughs> wait, wait, I swear on this? Of course. Of course. Oh, I'd be worried if you didn't. I, I listen to your show and everything, but I don't I don't remember where you can swear and where you can't. <laughs> and I swear a lot. So we mark, um, it, we mark it as explicit just to be safe. Good. You're going to need it for this. So, um, <laughs> so yeah. So then he... Henrik was like, well, I want to start working on a series of sequels to my movie Babysitter Massacre. And he's like, would you just spitball some ideas for the second one with me and write a novelization of the first movie? So I'm like, shit, yeah, I'll write a novelization. That's I don't care. Awesome. So I, never, I don't say no. Like, I, I like to work every minute of every day. So if people want me to do something, I'm just so happy to be doing anything so anyway so we got this is such a long answer to this freaking question so i'll take it so we we worked together we worked on a lot of projects uh around that time we got involved with fred olin ray who i'm sure i know you know um and we did six episodes of a boggy creek television series um cool that's available on amazon uh right now if you have Prime, I don't. It was free. I don't know if you have to pay for it. Fred wrote the first two episodes. I wrote episodes three through six. Henrik directed all of them. And then from there, he's like, "Well, you know, I, I I started to tell him about how I wanted to get into directing. I'd only done the short at that point. And he's like, "Well, why don't you do Babysitter Massacre three? It was four. I see. I get I get tripped up because originally ours was four. Oh, we got bumped to three. There's a fourth one coming that I'm going to write. And that's uh, that's still in, in the in the cards. You know, it's so hard because everything got all screwed up because something happened. And I don't know. I haven't heard about so, it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So that's where we are there. So that's how I got to be involved in that. And he said that it only had to be tangentially related. Yeah. Uh, so I was able to do whatever I wanted, which, of course, was a heavy metal horror film. And that's exactly what I what I did. Uh, a kid gets, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. A, a kid gets fed up with his life, and he ends up getting possessed by a dead rock star, and then everything goes to hell from there. So you, you know, it's going to be a fun time for I'm, sure. I'm excited to get my eyes on that. Oh, yeah, I, mean, I can't wait for to see it. It's always the hurry up and wait game. You know, when you do these things, movies or, or whatever. You hurry, you go at a mile, you know, a mile a minute, and then all of a sudden it's three years later, and you're like, "Wait, we fucking that's not out yet." What's going on? <laughs> so, you know, that's that's what happens all the time. Well, I was excited. I've, I I think I found Ouija Room at uh, Walmart. Yeah, and that we blew were... my that blew my mind. I was like, I know that guy. <laughs> I know it blew my mind too. It's just surreal because like I'd grow up, and then every Halloween we'd be all excited about the you know the Walmart display yep. oh yeah you know i i grew up in the same town as as our mutual friend shane migliavaca the cathode ray mission we've been best friends for 30 plus years so and we grew up in the ass end of nowhere <laughs> absolutely nowhere <laughs> but what we had was like eventually a walmart but what we did have was a lot of mom and pop video stores that you know would rent a, would let us rent 
anything and everything. And they got the gnarliest crap that you can imagine. SOV stuff and, you know, Fulci films and nice. all the crap that makes us us, you know. <laughs> so Yeah, we, we had the uh the the blockbuster syndrome hit our town pretty hard. I was in the uh Jupiter, Florida, a town so wonderful that they based a season of American horror story in it. <laughs> and uh so we had the blockbuster, but they hadn't blockbustered everything. You know, when they their 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 mission was to have eighty five copies of Pretty Woman ready, so they had to get rid of all these other movies that they had plenty of space for. And right. uh but before they got rid of everything, I could trick my mom into letting me rent stuff. Like that seventeen plus sticker that uh right. The blockbuster put on there. I was like, "Mom, they put that on everything." I totally like lied to her to get to rent Hellraiser two, and that's great. S- scared um, the shit out of myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my parents, my parents were always into this stuff and, and the horror and everything. So, like, I got cool with some with some crazy stuff real quick because <laughs> if they wanted to go see a movie, it was I was going too. Yeah, um, <laughs> and it didn't matter what it was. Uh, but the mom and pop stores were even more outrageous. Like I remember they got in so, uh, this minuscule selection of anime and they had, uh, uh, Yuritsuka Doji, legend of the over Of course they did. Of course yeah, they, they did. Let me rent that one. I strolled right out of there. With that <laughs> oh one. no. Oh yeah. Oh, oh my yeah. God. I didn't watch that till I was a grown ass man. And I was like, yeah. Whoa, dude. <laughs> I mean, it explains a lot of why I am like I am. That and a bunch of shit that I'm sure we'll get into. <laughs> Dude, that's that's freaking amazing though. I'm I'm uh I'm always curious to to see like how these things shake out, especially the we'll t- and we'll talk about like some of your favorite directors, some of your favorite films and everything, but like I feel like with Mercury Screams, you really had your influences on your sleeves. Like that was no holds barred, you doing whatever you wanted to do. And mm-hmm. really making something that feels like that 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 uh, tape you find in an abandoned house or like a, a transmission from a, um, a pirate TV station you weren't supposed to see. I really, really enjoyed that. That's exactly you know what, what I what I wanted to nail with it. Um, we grew up close to Canada, so we'd get all sorts of weird Canadian stuff. And then we get some, just you know regional stuff because we didn't have cable for for a while, um, so you know we get exposed to all these weird people. Well, PBS, of course, we had that channel. Yeah. You know, and they'd play all sorts of weird stuff. And then, um, I remember once in fifth grade we read the book Lizard Music. Did you ever read that book? No, no, I haven't heard of yeah. that. Okay. It's a kids' book, but it's about this kid and his parents leave him home alone. And his sister, like, is just like, screw this, man. I'm out of here. I got a guy to screw somewhere across town. So he's alone all the time. So he starts watching TV late at night. And what he finds is a pirate station run by lizards. And they're broadcasting all these strange shows, right? So that always stuck with me. Like, what Weird. would that be like? And then, like, I I heard about, like, you know, the Max Hedrum incident. I don't know yeah, if you've heard of that. I have. Yeah. yeah, signal interruptions and things like that. And I got really into that. And, uh. Uh, number stations. I'd find like logs of number stations and just listen to those. Um, and it was a conglomerate of that that stuff mixed with some true, uh, the, you know, true is in the eye of the beholder, I suppose. Paranormal incidents that happened to to my family are worked in there as well. Um, wow. And then it, it, it's expanded. The story has expanded. Um, I am working on a longer version of it which I know I've, I've mentioned to you. Um, yes. And if you, if you think that the, the short <laughs> was was out there, I can promise you, you ain't never seen anything like, like this. Oh, that's good so, news. I like that. Yeah. Nice. And, it's, and, and the new one is I pay. <laughs> so I don't know what the hell I was doing when I made a short. I just figured I could do it because I'm too stupid to not know that I, that I can't. So I went out there and I was like, I can make a movie. <laughs> got it so um you know i'm throwing fucking money around left and right now listen i don't work I, i'm a stay-at-home dad yeah. so i'm not throwing my money around i'm throwing caitlin's money around so she, <laughs> so, she's, so thank god for caitlin who makes all of this possible there's her little shout shout out there um but anyway so like i paid too much for everything um 
I did, I paid for a lot of things that I could have done myself, mm -hmm. I think. Um, I wanted a really good monster, so I actually paid a professional to make that creature. That was a custom-made creature for the for the film. Uh, nice. I drew it all out, and then he sculpted it beautifully and, and made it come to life. Um, oh, nice. And that's all for the short, you know? And I'm like, I feel bad about making this girl lie on the floor. Here's a little something for you for your time. <laughs> and here's like, you know, you, you can't expect, you know, I don't want to torture people for sure. But um, so when it came time to do this new one, um, I challenged myself to make it for no money, no money at all. So it incorporates a lot of techniques. Um, there's a monster in this one, but for instance, I built the monster in my living room. And I, I might have sent you those photos online. I know you the did. people listen. You definitely it's did. Gonna, it's not going to mean shit to them. But yeah, so I, <laughs> I constructed a puppet, which I filmed in front of a white wall in my in my living room. And then my editor, uh, J.B. Sapienza, he's my brother-in-law, a uh, very talented filmmaker. Um, and he, you know, is putting this creature on top of footage that uh, my actress, uh, Mary Liz Adams, a shout out to her too because she's incredible and she's also in babysitter massacre and awesome. uh she's in a she's in a couple other things that we shot during the pandemic which i can hint about but not talk about because everything's like being in the fucking justice league when you work on no budget movies so um <laughs> so uh yeah so like we're doing a lot of that we're doing some animation we're doing uh we're still filming it like the character in the story has to re for those that don't know has to record everything in her life because of a past traumatic event so that's where the found footage angle comes in because I, I don't want to just have that as a gimmick and not explain it you know yeah and more than just well the camera was accidentally left on her but you know so <laughs> I, I want it becomes organic but she has to record everything and in the process of making this movie jb and myself have found ourselves with this at we have this really cool uh camcorder app on our phone that's what we're filming it with just you know because it's going to look like shit it's supposed to look like shit so we went out and uh we're still finding and filming things we're like jesus this thing's like taking on our lives like is it's, it's taking over you know because we're still filming cool stuff that we found like oh here's footage of a moth we can use that in there for something or you know it just goes on and on and on so yeah yeah i gotta find a way to, to reel it in to bring it all everything has to mean something and everything yeah, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, already farty bullshit in it, of course. Of course. But it's it's, it's going to, I think, if you like, well, I hate to say found footage, because I guess such a such a connotation some sometimes, but it is, it is found footage. If you like found footage, but you also enjoy, you know, Euro sleaze and, and, and psychotronic cinema, then you're going to love this too. You know, it's just all these genres mashed up into one. Nice. So. Yeah, the one thing I thought of during the, uh, the the first lockdown, you know, was some intrepid filmmakers are going to be sneaking out yeah. and running around and making something because, like, that was the first thing people were talking about was it feels apocalyptic. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm driving down frickin' uh, Del Mabry, the big road up by us here, and it was, like, me and six other cars – and I'm like, this yes. is, this is, that's awesome. People aren't even dead yet. And I'm loving this. <laughs> well, you know, and, and you're right. Like when, it, when this thing hit, I was like, I have to find a way to continue creating and working. I don't want to just stop. Yeah. And, and I mean, not to sound, you know, like a star is born or any shit like that. Uh, maybe not the ending of that, but what, but what, what I did is I, uh, <laughs> I uh, you know, I, 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 I got, I'm not, a young guy by any means and i finally got this this break that i needed you know i was working in the video game industry and then i got laid off right when we were having our first kid and my wife was like you stay home and watch the kids because that's cheaper than getting daycare up here is ridiculous right yep it's so expensive and i don't really want other people watching my kids because i'm you know paranoid maniac so um well what i did is you know and then i she's like well why don't you start working on this film stuff that you've always wanted to do you know and it just started going right from there like i was talking about the stuff with henrik and then it snowballed into this stuff and then COVID hit and i was like because i don't you know i don't need any more setbacks you know no. 
no one needs any more setbacks. Um, Not in this day so, and age. Oh my yeah, god! Right? <laughs> right, exactly. And I was like, shit. You know, if we do found if Hen- Henrik came to me with some ideas, and then I and then this Mercury screams thing, I was just like, this is perfect because like I didn't have contact with anyone. I gave everyone the app. I gave everyone their scenes. I told them how to block it out to some extent. Some of them I didn't have to. Some of them I just trust. Like Mary is amazing. She knows exactly what to do just from what she reads in the script. And then I'd get the footage back and then we'd, we'd do what we needed to do and, and, and stuff like that. But it was such an amazingly organic way to make a film and totally different than than the, the short version of it or even, you know, uh, Babysitter Massacre, which was just a, yeah. a straightforward shoot. You know, it's just like any other shoot. You block out your your days and, you you know, you you get all your shots for the day and, you know, you're on your way with this. It's just like it's still happening. That's what's weird about this movie that we're or this. It's not even a movie. This thing that we're making that's just uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I, look, I look forward to whatever it turns out to be, because I think it's going to be this epic freaking thing. Like, I just anticipate this like multimedia firestorm of this coming out like i could see like weird links and hidden things and like even even if you just get to like the dvd or the blu-ray where it's like massive strangeness yeah like make it so so different and strange where you know instead of play menu Mm -hmm. oh it's all symbols and strangeness you know get go nuts you know video producer man richard schmidt here he is i'm an ideas no. man i am really <laughs> bad at any kind of like know-how but i got some shit <laughs> um no and that's awesome because i think the one thing i mean i like the blair witch project for what it is i mean i know a lot of people just really love it but the one thing that they did and a lot of people really hate it but the one thing that they did that was absolutely genius was that online shit because nobody had done that before. And you go to that website and it was just so rich with that mythology and the, yep. you know, yeah. the supposed stories and this, that, and the other thing. The and it's books like, wow. and the comics and all the weird yes. little stuff. Yeah. What a, what an amazing thing that they did with that movie, you know, and then totally fucked that up later on, but whatever, <laughs> but <laughs> you can't win them all. No, you know, it, it was, I mean, I, I'm a big, big fan of, of, of that. Like I, I was never uh, convinced or fooled that it was real. I, I knew, went into it somehow. Somebody had just told me straight up that it wasn't real. So I was not. You'd already seen Cannibal Holocaust and you knew how these things go. Well, at the time, <laughs> at the time I was definitely less of a horror fanatic. Like my mm-hmm. horror, all my horror I want to say genomes, and that's not even the right thing, went dormant. And I just was like, into like artsy films and i was into like just just weird abstract stuff all horror had would bubble back to the surface in the early 2000s is was, like was that like the tarantino effect like he came out and then you got into stuff because he was not not that pretty much about his influences as much as if i'm just saying well yeah maybe his influences too because he would be talking about uh john woo movies and yeah and the, the like well yeah and exactly the 90s was all about that independent and foreign mm-hmm. film market because the the horror that was being mass produced was pretty bad. Like I have a very I have a lot of affection now for nineties horror. Looking back on it during the at the time, it just alienated me from what I loved about horror and I just got sick of it. And it was very mm-hmm. easy to let horror go for a while because I find out later there was great 90s shit, but you had mm-hmm. to dig. And what did Blockbuster do? They yeah, buried you're not, it. They buried right, all that gonna, stuff. You're not going to be finding that yeah. stuff. So when, when I got back into horror, um, but yeah, for Blair Witch Project, it was just having a great crowd and a mm-hmm. great theater experience and just being blown away and then talking about it with my friend on the drive home because we went to the middle of nowhere to go see it. And Mm -hmm. on the way back, we're driving in fog on the highway at night as the temperature is dropping as much as it can in Tampa, you know, and just being (laughs) terrified talking about what we'd just seen and Mm -hmm. and just that experience of of having it get crazier. It's like, uh, you know, a lot of people hate remakes, but The Ring, 
in 2002. That was a, one of the reasons why I got back into horror because I had never heard of Ringu. I, right. I knew there was a tape that killed you after seven days. Mm-hmm. And then the movie fucking shows it to you. And so mm-hmm. in your brain, you're like, I'm dead in seven okay. days. But, but isn't that cool just for a second? Exactly. Just for a second. You know? you know, and my my wife, uh, my when she was my girlfriend at the time, we were dating. It was one of our first date movies. We were destroyed by r- the ring. We couldn't mm-hmm. stop seeing um, whatever her name was, Samara, whatever it was in the American version. She, right. we'd see her in the corner of the room while we were talking, and just like, ugh, and we were so, so messed up. On you. Yeah, yeah. So that's what got me going again. But yeah, I'm I'm, I'm like pff, I'm nuts about Blair Witch, so. The and the books and the comics and all that stuff and even part two, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I even love part two. Yeah, and, you, and, you and Shane, there's that name again. <laughs> yeah, he's he, he and I are uh, we're 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 ridiculous for that movie. The, the, I went to the movies to see it with him, so I know. Oh, wow. <laughs> the 2016 one, it, it also exists. I haven't uh, even seen that. It's uh, it's uh, they ruined the best moment in the trailer. There's a moment in that movie. That is like shit your pants, jaw dropping and totally clever and perfect. And they freaking put it in the trailer. The mm-hmm. best moment yeah, is great. in the trailer. <laughs> and that's back that's when I didn't know. That's why <laughs> that's back when I didn't know better. Now, I don't right. watch trailers now. If I'm if I give a crap, I'm not watching that trailer. Hey, you're better off not because so many things are spoiled, you know? Oh, yeah. So. The, the what inspired me to to talk to you, other than I've always found you very attractive, is <laughs> uh, you're talking about your comic book. You you wrote and did you write how many issues is this going to be? Is this an ongoing thing or is this like a no, finite um, number? It's it's funny. Um, the one that that came out, there's four total issues. Okay, um, and the the hardcover. Uh, version that came out collects the first there's a there's a zero issue that i did not write it was written before i got brought onto the project and then uh it contains the first three issues that i wrote and i'm pretty sure uh he's gonna do something with that fourth issue because it's probably gonna be a bigger sized one i would say i don't know 100 percent um you know once you write something for the comic book industry that's kind of where you get left off (laughs) they don't really keep you in the loop you know, on anything. So I wrote that that series, uh, Grave Cult, it's called. Um, Cult. And then I have written a bunch of other books uh, for him that have not come out yet. Uh, by him, I mean uh, Everett Hartso. Uh, he's a an outlaw comic book artist from the 90s. He created a character called Razor. She was like in that whole bad girl genre. She had like big blades on her hands and she teamed up with a crow in a comic oh, book. Nice. So that's some cool shit. Um, that's where I knew the guy from. Uh, and I was really excited to work with him. And he's really he's he's cool. He's easy to work with. He doesn't make me do a lot of changes or or anything like that. And I can put in whatever I want. So in, in this Grave Cult comic, I you know, he's like, I want it to be like a you know, like a grindhouse movie, for want of a better term. And I'm like, Oh, I'll give you that. I'll give you that right <laughs> up. And I just went ape shit with it. There's dinosaurs, there's aliens, there's uh, zombies, there's a Frankenstein monster that's Elvis who runs a Jim Jones like cult. Oh, nice. There's strippers that are the heroes. There's a zombie that uses twin dildos as weapons and he has a parasitic <laughs> twin that Holy comes out shit. of it. Like I just lost my my well, I mean I always lose my mind when I do shit cuz I just don't I I my 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 way of working is, is I would be damned if I let anybody tell me what I'm going to fucking do. So I just do whatever <laughs> I want to do. And it's the weirdest shit. And nobody says to me, hey, see, you, know, you got to calm that down. No one says it. So I just keep going. <laughs> so, you know. Nice. Well, it's good that you had someone who was uh, who was open to your madness. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's just weird how things happen. Like. I've always wanted to to write comics. I've always wanted to review films. I've always wanted to make movies. And now finally I'm doing all of this stuff. And I think the wonderful thing about it is, is that with the way the internet is, and, and, you know, I'm sounding like grandpa now, but with modern technology, anybody literally can do this shit. It's not like, you know, I, I got some secret magic power that made me do all this stuff. I just 
contacted people. Actually, what I, I mean, I don't know. Do you want me to go into how I got to this point? It's a quick story. Yes, please. Absolutely. Go for right. it. What happened is I got laid off from work, so I could no longer afford my expensive boutique label horror movies that I enjoyed so much. So I found out that if I review movies, people will give them to me. Yep. So, uh, and as you know, as you well know, Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure everyone that knows that we review movies knows that we don't, we don't pay for that shit. I mean, that's (laughs) why we do it. We don't, I don't get paid to review movies. I get paid in movies. Exactly. So, so I did that. And then I'd, I'd watch a lot of, like people liked my reviews because I swear a lot and, and talk about boobs and shit and, uh, you know, all the things that, that people love. And um, <laughs> the independent horror guys would write to me and they're like, hey, you want to review my movie? You know, nobody's watching my movie. And I'd be like, yeah, I'll watch your movie. And then I'd ask them questions. Since I did them a favor for reviewing their movie, I'd be like, can you ask, can I ask you some questions about filmmaking or writing or whatever? And then you make contacts. And then, you know, it just came about that Henrik needed that script for that movie that he was going to, that we were going to pitch. And uh, it all went from there so literally anyone can can do that you don't have yeah. to do the reviewing part you just if you see your people online ask them questions you know and, and he strikes me uh henrik does as, as a real doer like he is God. yeah prolific He's yeah and then through him we also do the uh the weekly spooky uh podcast which which yes. i produce which is all horror stories from a variety of authors uh shane of course I have to shoehorn myself in there sometimes for the for the ego trip that I so desperately need, and um, I, yeah, and we just hit our hundredth episode on that. Oh, so, that's great! Yeah, so hundred episodes in, um, you know, and then along with that, there's books that we that we wrote. There's the the campfire stories book. Yes, that uh, was an anthology book. Um, so yeah, so that's you know that's another avenue of things, and then through that, I was able to get shane involved and, and things like so it's good to you know get your friends involved and... of course what um what uh i know you write for horrorfuel.com I do. is yep. there other sites i mean i know you have the daniel 13 blog what is the, I name did. Of the blog or is it still uh, going well it's 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 now defunct uh it's, it was called the outre eye of daniel 13 okay um, thank you what what happened with that was that was an interesting story and i'll, and I'll definitely tell you so i was working for famous monsters of, of filmland and I developed that whole shtick, the Daniel 13 character pretty much on there, which isn't really a character. It's just pretty much how I talk. And I'm a, a goofy bastard. So so is he. So uh, <laughs> so I was working for them for a while. And then uh, they just changed up what they were doing, their business model model or whatever. And I was kind of just floating around waiting for another website to pick me up. So uh, I started that uh, blog in the interim and then i got picked up by horror fuel um which is where i've been for a while now yeah excellent i'm always impressed with your good attitude and is like you do not like lay into a film with the freaking knives out to to like mm-hmm. to start some shit like you are uh very uh forgiving in some cases and you're you're like you are maybe you're like me where you're at an age, a certain age. I'm not sure if, uh, hopefully you're younger than me. Um, I don't know about that one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll compare sizes later. Um, yeah. but the, the, like, you just, you want to make, um, an excuse for like your time. Like you want to say, this was an experience. I lived this, this hour and a half that I just went through and I want to make it worth my while. So I'm going to go into it with, you know, at least a slight smile and, and enjoy it for what it is. Yeah, and, and and another thing too is that my reviews are more about are based on feeling. Like, what did the movie entertain me? Was it filled with everything that I wanted to see? Did it live up to the promise of what it you know what I thought it was supposed to be? That sort of thing. I don't care about the technical stuff. I mean, right. people people work with what what they have, and I think that's a thing. You know, being on the other side of it too, I, I'm I'm a lot more sympathetic. I think to things than than other people would be if they have no knowledge of what goes into actually making yeah. something that is a thread the, a common thread with uh, with independent filmmakers uh, when i talk to uh, uh matt farley and charles roxburgh the shock marathons guys the motern media uh mm-hmm. they had the exact same thing where they found that their reviews 
once they started making films and really, you know, churning out like uh, a production, you know, then you see the the nightmare of getting something finalized. So yeah, right. And it's not it's it's not an easy job. Filmmaking is not an easy job, and independent filmmaking is an even harder job because you're doing multiple multiple things i mean like yeah i'm the director but i'm also making chili and i'm also <laughs> you know doing this that and the other thing making sure people have water and 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 you know things like that but yeah you know people don't think about that shit you know they watch avengers and that had 95 people just to take care of chris <laughs> evans asshole you know i mean <laughs> i mean that's, it, that's america's evans asshole on, yeah if he was on my set i'd be wiping his ass see people don't think about that <laughs> <laughs> and that's the difference, folks, between Hollywood movies and independent <laughs> cinema. No one's taking care of my asshole, goddammit. No, nope. <laughs> that's right. I don't have somebody to do that for me. <laughs> so I met this girl. I asked her to dinner in a movie. She asked, what do you have in mind? So I said, Make it a blockbuster night and a border night too. for a two-for-one blockbuster video rental when you buy food and a medium drink at Taco Bell. Cross the border! What are some of your first memories of horror in any medium? I know we talked about your your VHS days, but is there something that that like really hit you at that perfect age or maybe too young that just scared you? Was there something that just made you the, the beautiful man you are today? <laughs> some of my earliest memories would definitely be uh watching very old public domain horror on regional channels uh that was that's what got me interested um around that same time there was uh the crestwood books the monster the, the ones that would feature a different monster in, in each volume and they'd tell you how different movies were shot and things like that i don't know if you're familiar with those books but uh our library had them and they were just an amazing, amazing influence. And I always was into, you know, my parents were always into horror movies. And so I've always been exposed to them and, and been into them. And then conversely, the one time I can remember being totally terrified of a movie was when we went to see Close Encounters. Oh my God. Yes. And, and the scariest part of that movie for me, besides the part where the kid gets taken from the house, which yep. is horrifying, is the, uh, when the ship, the doors first open and they send out that thing. I don't know even what it's supposed to be. It's got, it's, it doesn't look like the other aliens. No, it, I don't know what it is. And it terrified me. That yes. thing scared the shit. Out of me. I, don't even know, I don't even know what it's supposed to be. It doesn't, it's never explained. It's, is it one of them? He's just bigger. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, it is. It is iconic. And you, you like, I think they just had, they want to f get as many different types of freaking aliens in there. And so instead of really going into it at all, in any way at all, they just said, fuck it. This is <laughs> crazy. We have to use this. And yeah, that, that's one of the magic things about, I love that movie. And that also scared the bejesus out of me as a kid. Yeah. And that surprises people too. When you say that they're like, you, you know, you weren't scared of horror movies as a kid. I'm like, no, but that thing was terrifying. And I still think about it. Like, even if I, you know, watch that movie to this day and that scene's coming up, I get all nervous. Like, I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I don't know. One of the scariest uh, movies experiences of my life was uh, my, I was staying at my friend's house. I think I was, I couldn't have been more than 12. Maybe I might have been 13. And the movie uh, Communion was on, uh, yeah. was the new release, was on the new release wall and his mom rented and we watched Communion, which is... It's now terrifying for the uh, the totally like over the top Christopher Walken. Is it Christopher Walken? Oh no, it is Christopher Walken, the director of Howling two and three. Oh my god! Okay, so uh, yeah. Yeah. he's he they, that director let him go guns a blazing <laughs> like he is he sure out did. and about. He's walking all over that film. Hey, and uh, it's just like she was a big old slice of ham in that one. Man. <laughs> 
<laughs> but all the shit with the aliens, all the shit with how the aliens approach him and come after him, the, the motion detectors outside their remote cabin. And then when yep. you finally have things in the corner of the room, it's like such a like in touch with a child's nightmare. And I was old enough to know better, but mm -hmm. it still ended up with my friend and I insisting on sharing his bed because we needed to be close to each other to not be totally shitting like, ourselves. Like like two like cavemen. Like yeah. you just need the constant contact to know that the night isn't gonna come and eat you. <laughs> oh my god. It's like it's like I always think about that like that moment and I my grandmother wasn't there, uh, but she was the one who tried to out me to my family. Like she told everybody I was gay. And it, <laughs> because it was communion, <laughs> just because she just thought I was gay, but like, uh, it, I mean, it still hasn't come true. I'm still waiting to see if I'm gay. I don't know. It was just one of those things where you, you know, I was so scared that you know, like 1989 middle school homophobia did not get to me, and I was just clutching my friend in the darkness, like <laughs> for safety's sake. <laughs> <laughs> it was. I mean, it was. A there's parts of that that oh, are scary. If you live in a rural area, it's even scarier. Oh, and God. the book was scary. The the book that it's based on was scary. Oh, I need to read that. Oh, it's it's intense, man. Same name, Communion. Nice. I will look for it. Whitley Stryber, the guy that wrote The Wolfen. Oh, my God. I love Wolfen. What a yeah. weird freaking movie. I love it. Uh, so what about um like authors or or horror stories horror novels that have have influenced you like what are some of your uh your 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 people who've uh gotten to you gotten under your skin over the years um well definitely you know when i was growing up stephen king was the king so you would read tons of stephen king oh, yeah. um i've always enjoyed uh clive barker um yes. In fact, I gravitated, I'd say as I got more into my to my older teenage years, I was probably more into to Clive Barker because I was more, you know, drawn to gothy things and stuff like that. And he just fits into that whole scene, too. Um, yeah. And I was reading, you know, and I'd always read a lot of uh, a lot of pulp stuff. Howard Lovecraft. Um, yeah. I mean, nothing too out of the ordinary as far as the 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 authors are concerned yeah no i i was uh getting swept up in the stephen king wave like mm -hmm. there was there was that 80s thing where you couldn't escape him you right. could not get away from him like even my parents who um they 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 read a lot uh but they were definitely bestseller new release at the video store people like whatever was hip because they wanted to have stuff to talk mm -hmm. about with people you know but right. that meant that as soon as Stephen King was the the man dominating the freaking bestseller list, they just picked him up like everything else. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> next thing you know, I'm reading Misery when I'm 11. And, <laughs> and it's like, what is happening were, to my brain? Were they into that, that club, the Stephen King book club, where they'd send you like a different one of his novels each month? Uh, maybe. Maybe they were, because we definitely had... From like, um, yeah, I, I think we we must have because we had everything that that era of like misery and mm -hmm. the dark half and Tommy Knockers. Like we always had those books like steadily pumping into our household, and I was more than happy. Like my one of my most precious memories as a kid was reading um, Tommy Knockers over the summer mm -hmm. that it, the summer it came out, and just being so swept away and, and hearing people like. Whoa, 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 that's your favorite? And I'm like, well, yeah, dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> the the main character is a, a bad beat poet. You know, like, what? <laughs> he has, his poem is Hey Motherfucker. Like, I'll never I mean, forget that. I mean, that, <laughs> <laughs> see? I mean, that's that's why everybody likes Stephen King. See? But yeah, and then, uh, you know, it's it's just, and falling out with him in the 90s, because like he, it was just, he started to do stuff that was weird, and things that I would accept now. Right. Like, like uh, the, the 
insomnia was so weird Mm -hmm. and so out there that it, it literally made me angry enough to throw it in the dumpster when I finished it because it, I was so pissed that it wasn't a horror novel right without metaphysical and uh basically a happy ending you know like the the villains were actually uh part of the cycle of the universe and they were important and it was also a spoiler alert and you know spoiler alert for a (laughs) 300 year old book but uh yeah it's just it just enraged me whereas now i'd be like man this book is weird i like it you know (laughs) right yeah i mean it's it's weird how tastes change like you know, when you're a kid, you look at comic books and you don't like Jack Kirby, but you look at them now and you're like, holy shit, this yeah. guy's awesome. Oh, my God. Like, and the only thing with Jack, uh, thank you for even mentioning that. Like, he had some stories that mm-hmm. were so purely Kirby that were right. amazing. And then at some point, he needed a writer. And mm-hmm. the DC and Marvel were so happy to have him back. You know, because he kept getting screwed by one company and going here and getting, you know, and, right. and, and then they just let him write and draw his stuff. And I feel like there was a point where they really should have paired him up with some some hotshot writer. Mm-hmm. And it would have made the, I think the latter half of his career a lot more successful. I mean, I still love because like I was just pick up any issue of the Eternals. Right. And just leave your brain like on the freaking nightstand by your bed because you're done. Like it's so perfect. His, con- his concepts are just wild. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. You know, and there again, you know, I, I like that, that aesthetic and I try to use that. Say, not that I'm Jack Kirby by any means, but I, I try to use that same aesthetic too, you know, just making it as imaginative and crazy as I, yep. as I possibly can. I always find it really funny when he's like leaving the melodrama out because of course I'm a big old freaking soap opera craven person. Like that's one of the things that makes my freaking head explode for Marvel is like, Oh my God is Cyclops and Jean Grey going to get back together, bro. <laughs> like that's right. like, that's me right. like losing sleep because I need to read the next issue like a chump. Whereas right. Jack, Jack Kirby's like, I, have characters that are dealing with a a, a planet sized spaceship. They don't have time for love, you know. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like, where's the love, Jack? Yeah, and I mean, I was just flipping through. I got a collection of superpowers, you know, the series he did two two uh, mini series in the in the mid '80s. And they're the characters get stuck going through these dimensions, and in one dimension they end up in like the goblets of these giant dead gods i'm like what the hell is this that's so cool (laughs) i'm like and it's a two-page spread and i'm like what and it means nothing they're out of that dimension in a second you know (laughs) dude and that's the thing that's so funny like all of my comic book reading as a teenager was so limited by what i could afford and it was the 90s and the comic book market sucked donkey dicks and so right. I couldn't look at back issues. Mm-hmm. I couldn't get a Jack Kirby comic for under $25 in 1993 money. So mm-hmm. all I could do was read whatever was new. And so I didn't really understand space. So when I'm watching Guardians of the Galaxy and I'm like, why are these motherfuckers in space? Right. This is weird. And then looking at the cosmic stuff, I never knew about the Infinity Gauntlet. I never knew about Jack Kirby's work and the the even you know, his crossover stuff with DC, like you know the the Eternals and uh, was it called the Gods something Gods, the New Gods, the New Gods. I knew none of that shit, and I knew none of that stuff existed. And now that um, I'm a grown up man, baby, and I can actually find these used copies of these collections on eBay, I'm reading more comic books than I ever even saw in my teenage years and it's just yeah. oh what a revelation yeah yeah i know it's and you know and, and a lot of the stuff for me is the same way when i was a kid i, I wasn't really into superheroes i'd read conan comics and star yeah. wars and, you know stuff like i was into that stuff for sure oh you god know, i read uh, the punisher Blech. swamp thing <sighs> yeah 90s, 90s punisher man i can't i look back at that now and i'm like yikes 
<laughs> yeah, there's some some rough. I can you we're thinking of the same story. And I'm, like, <laughs> I'm not gonna say a word, but um, <laughs> but I read it and I was there when it came out and I thought I, it was stupid. I right? just loved Uzis. I just loved Uzis. Give me an Uzi, I'm happy. You get them too, because he that was the that's the the most 80s 90s weapon you can possibly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, and you know you you were asking about authors earlier too, but it was weird because like. I'd say my influences, even though I write a lot, weren't really authors as much as movies or right. just weird shit that I'd see. You know what I mean? Like things would just show up on TV. It's, that's kids don't realize this stuff now, man. They can find anything at any time, and I mean I do too, and I love it. But yes. but there's nothing quite like waking up on a Saturday morning and throwing on the TV and. It's supposed to be like pro bowling, but it's a it's instead they decided to show Super Inframan or something like yes. that. Yes, you know, yeah, or, or, or uh, Elvira Star- showing a Gamera Super Monster, right? Or you know, I remember once I came home on a on an afternoon from being out with my parents, and, and Star Crash was on. Holy shit! When I was a kid, I saw that movie as a child on TV. Nice. Um, and Very that's nice. crazy, you know, and it's a. That's just like one of my favorite movies of all time anyway. Yeah, yeah, um, now it's now I think what's going to happen is everyone has to have a weird uncle. Right. And not not the not the pervy touchy kind like the 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 <laughs> right. hopelessly nerdy uncle who's like I'm not turning off this bonkers ass shit just because I'm I've agreed to babysit this one time. And so this kid is seeing like um some 80s mecha anime with uh people getting fried and their robots you know like <laughs> yeah. you know, it changes their life it, it does and i like and you were asking about early memories about about horror i know you were asking like you know like super childhood but like i remember when i was like maybe 10 or 11 and i was hanging out with my older cousins and they had rented dawn of the dead and i'd never seen oh anything like that before and i was like this is how do you how do you do this? How do you put this on film and it comes out and people are like totally cool with it? I'm yeah. like, this is pretty fucking rad, man. I don't understand. You know, and then, you know, as time would go on, you know, you'd see like, I remember somebody had a copy of Evil Dead 2 and that was a revelation. Oh and my then, God, yes. And like I'd never seen anything, even though I'd seen Dawn of the Dead, it's a different animal. I mean, I'd never seen something so so crazy gory and no. funny at the same time. I saw, of course, like a lot of people, I saw evil dead too, way before I saw evil dead, but I miss the sense of, of video store revelations where like you would just pick something up because of the cover, because of somebody had somebody's cousin's brother had seen it. And they said that there was some crazy shit in it. And, you know, I mean, now it's just, it's so easy. I mean, I, it's a, you know, it's a double edged sword because it's so cool because we can get, everything yeah literally it's wild but at the same time we already know this sh- we're not buying this stuff blind we've read reviews <laughs> we've watched videos. we yep. you know what i mean I like we you know you talk about it with your friends everybody's knows something about it when when i grew up it was it was me and shane <laughs> all my information came from him and i still to this day don't know where the hell he got it you so, know what i think is neat is that there are free channels on like a Roku where you have Mm -hmm. the film rise channel and you have Tubi and stuff like that, where parents are are like probably locking down the showtime and they're locking down Netflix, but they're probably forgetting about the Tubi. And like, so there's going to be kids like I want to watch zombies and they're going to find some random ass public domain bullshit you know or an independent film they're going to be watching i think the the crazy shit is you go to amazon prime and there's hundreds of indie films i know and it's like I'm... god man the, the the market is crazy and you know it it's it's weird too cuz like it, it's really like i know a lot of people are are you know feeling negative but my god to be a film fan today is just it's it's absurd I'm, like it's our greatest our greatest fucking dreams have come true <laughs> like yeah, anything if, we want we can get if you are not one of those people with a magnifying glass on your 4k tv looking at the film grain or you notice that the film is like cropped at one point right 
you right. know, one eight five point two instead of one eight five five point sixteen or whatever. And you're because you know, there's so many people who are so spoiled. Right. You right. Know, I didn't get my puzzle that was supposed to come with oh, my pieces, oh, Blu-ray. Oh, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> I know exactly who you're fucking talking about. <laughs> That was famous. That was famous. I do have a Dawn of the Dead story. I think you'll like this. So I have that puzzle too. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do. Uh, so I have a Dawn of the Dead story. You're gonna love this. So in grade school, no, in uh, sixth grade, so middle school, um, there was a kid who everybody picked on. He he had a stuttering problem, and they'd all pick on him for his stutter, and I would stand up for him and everything. But he was like the first horror fan I was aware of. I, I'm sure I mingled among them once in a while unknowingly but he was the first one who was out and about with his horror fandom yeah. and he always had horror t-shirts he always talked about horror movies he had a dawn of the dead t-shirt and i asked him about what it was and mm -hmm. it was this zombie's head exploding and i asked <laughs> him you know what's that movie it looks great and he goes oh it's dawn of the dead and i'm like okay cool he's like yeah this is the king zombie this is the king of the zombies in the movie and I'm like, whoa. He's like, yeah, they, and they, they blow his head off with a grenade launcher. And I'm like, holy shit, I can't wait to see Dawn of the Dead. And, you know, like two years later, 13 year old me rents Dawn of the Dead. I'm super psyched. Mm -hmm. and that head, that zombie's head explodes in that apartment building from the guy with the machine gun. I'm like, hold up, hold up. That wasn't <laughs> the king of the zombies. That was just the dude in the apartment who gets his head blown off. And I realized that this was like <laughs> this poor kid who was picked on every day he was he just developed this defense mechanism by being a liar. <laughs> right. Some, or he was just literally messing with me because he, he thought I'd never watch it or something. But it was you want oh the king God. of the zombies? Here's the gunk. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe he uh wrote that movie maybe he's working on his magnum opus um, oh. of the king zombie movie <laughs> you even imagine he probably... <laughs> i was we'll waiting for the revelation that i was like fucking Zack snyder or something I was like, oh <laughs> and that boy grew up to be a dickhead no, he's completely... fine i'm i would defend him all over again if i had to uh yeah. so so <laughs> Who are some of your favorite horror directors? Let's see. Uh, we'll start with the obvious ones that everyone loves: John Carpenter, okay, Sam yes. Raimi, the the you know the the guys, the dudes. Uh, I really love Shinya Sukamoto, especially his earlier stuff, like yes. uh, Tetsuo the Iron Man, uh, is one of my favorite films and one of my bigger influences. Um, only Shane has seen my college film which steals from that exponentially. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. To the point where it's just like, what the fuck, dude? You should have just edited in scenes from that movie. and just <laughs> Nobody's seen it. They would never know. <laughs> How did you get those effects? <laughs> you know, it's amazing. Uh, why is everybody Japanese? What's going on? <laughs> That's makeup, we live, dude. That's just we makeup. live in the middle of the mountains in upstate New York. Well, where's all these Japanese people coming from? <laughs> um, actually, I, I joke, but that that college that we attended there did have a large Japanese student body and it was awesome cool. because I had friends that would get tapes like straight from Japan. So we'd be watching like Yu Yu Hakusho and, and things like that. And I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't know what was going on because I don't speak Japanese, but it was just cool to see it as it was fresh and new. I went off on a tangent there. No, no, that's <laughs> all right. It might, yeah, I, that's so I, important to my upbringing as well is, is catching anime. I still haven't, identified to this day um catching anime when i was six on mm -hmm. local tv they just had mm -hmm. random it could have been anything could have been um not voltron but like is it battle of the planets is that a you, or is that a, that's that's an italian that's an italian space movie isn't it no battle battle of the planets was was g-force uh super yes. science so, so, yeah. exactly i probably saw something like that i probably saw something like captain harlock or something on tv as a oh, kid for sure that, and that just gets in your bloodstream and you have to see more when you're a kid. Yeah, no, I, the, the first anime that I definitely saw that I remember was battle of the planets. And the second one was star blazers, which is yes. space battleship Yamato. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know why I say this stuff. If you're listening to the show, you will probably already know all this bullshit that I'm saying anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah. And then it, it it's just weird. Like you get exposed to, to certain things and it just sticks with you forever. You know, my, 
here's a homespun tale and then I'll get back on these directors and answer your fucking question. Um, <laughs> when I was a kid, my, the, the main industry in town was leather working. Uh, they'd get in skins from all over and cut them up and, and send them out and make gloves. Oh, wow. Um, and my dad worked in one such factory and he got a piece of white leather and he went to the local Woolworth, Woolworths and I'm getting all mushy mouth and he, uh, got a space helmet that sort of looked like there's, you know, they dress it for people that don't know. They dress up like birds. Um, and it had like that kind of bill thing oh, on it wow. and he painted it white and he put that cape on it and he made me a belt. And that's like one of the biggest, like memories of my dad is like oh, he made he made that suit shit. and i'm like yeah that was and like and then people and that's the thing people are like well why do you still care about this shit because it's it's integral to our existence yeah. i mean you know people don't understand too like the importance of these films it can be a security blanket it can be an inspiration it can be anything it doesn't even have to be the greatest film ever made it can be fucking attack of the killer tomatoes for all i know, <laughs> you know? whatever whatever makes you happy you yeah know? i mean i am that's, a, that's how i look at it i am a big fan of toxic zombies um it's mm -hmm. one of the most lackluster garbage zombie movies ever made but it really defined my tastes in like i need more carnage I need like I went through the whole gore hound phase twice in my life where I had to see the goriest of the gory and um just like a sleepy movie about hippies trying to grow pot getting mm -hmm. getting sprayed with stupid <laughs> experimental weed killer cuz it's killing the weed bro <laughs> it just doesn't seem fair you know <laughs> like now that it's legal it's all legal right. But no, I just, I, yeah, there's, there's, I am criminally nostalgic and I don't, I don't care at all what, me too. you know, I drove, uh, I drove my kids absolutely bonkers the other day. Cause they're like, what are the, what are some of the songs that, you know, cause my, my kids really like the music that I listen to and I, and I like metal and, 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 and things like that, but not, you know, screamy metal. I'm, I'm a big hair metal fan, yeah, stuff like that. Of course unapologetically and uh but sometimes it's fun to just mess with the kids so they're like dad what what's some of the songs you remember from growing up and i put oh, on no. uh, the theme from uh super snooper you know super fuzz the that the, <laughs> did you ever see that movie is that the one where he, it's the it's the italian sergio corbucci the guy that did django yeah the, yeah the, the the king of the spaghetti depressed urn he gets uh he gets uh uh, the guy gets uh, superpowers yep. and he's a cop and er Ernest Borgnine's in it. I and, saw that uh, in the theaters, dude. Oh my God. Yep. So I played, I played them the theme song to that. You're the hunter from the future and uh, <laughs> Yeti giant of the 20th century. I thought they were going to kill me by times. The shit had, had reached its apex. <laughs> I'd never seen such murderous children. <laughs> Their respect for you is going to take ages to recover that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> i'm their dad this is what they got so <laughs> Anyway, we were talking about directors. Yes. Uh, so, Raimi, Carpenter, Shinya Tsukamoto, uh, uh, Nobuhiko Obayashi, because Halsu is the best oh, movie. Oh, yeah. Panos Cosmatos, I'm really into his stuff, all Dude. two of them. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're ready for uh, more. Yeah, exactly. I really love, and here's here's where it's going to take a nosedive. I really love uh, Bruno Matai. No, uh, that's a nose up. I love it. Yeah, he's just it's in, it's just genius the things that he can do. And you know, I'd even throw Fragasso in there too because sometimes they're interchangeable <laughs> <laughs> for better or for worse. Yeah, those are the ones that really stand out. Uh, Ed Wood, of course, is always a huge inspiration with his with his work, not so much his personal drinking habits. But yeah, what, yeah. So there you go. I those don't are know. Oh, those are great. That's that's um, heady stuff, just to <laughs> to say the least. Yeah, we um we do have um an episode of uh Simon and I 
geeking out on uh, Beyond the Black Rainbow. So oh, it's so good. It's oh, so good. God. Yeah. It's so Andy was every bit as good. Yeah, I I'm more I'm more Black Rainbow, but I am also I mean I love Mandy, but yeah, there's there's something about that you know not to, for anyone who hasn't seen Beyond the Black Rainbow, just freaking go watch it. That last shot, that last shot where it Which just is, it gets uh, to me. I'm not going to tell people how to live their lives, but I wouldn't necessarily watch that film sober. <laughs> <laughs> That's my problem is I watch it like criminally sober. <laughs> right. The cops, the, like the cops come and give me a beer like, dude, come on. Here, take this. You're going to need this. <laughs> and of course, Simon and I, oh, I, you know, spoiler alert for that episode. We go on a long tangent about drugs. So it's great. Oh, good. Good times. As it, sh- as it should be. Yeah, that's an amazing movie. Ooh. Like I did. I wasn't prepared for that movie at all when I watched it. But boy, was I glad I did. Yeah. Well, dude. We did the talking. We did this. Yes, we did. So so I know folks can find your movie reviews at horrorfuel.com. Um, what true. are some other resources to get people get their Dan fix? Well, if you would like to watch Ouija Room, it is currently available on Tubi TV, which is free. Um, it is also on Amazon Prime, as is Fred Olin Ray's Boggy Creek, the Bigfoot series, which I wrote episodes three through six of. Nice. Um, and if you Google Weekly Spooky, you can listen to our weekly podcast of scary stories, a different story each week. Uh, we are on our 100th episode, so it's a two-parter with multiple stories. Um, it's got uh, some real corkers in there, let me tell you. I got one in there. Shane's got one in there. Yeah, there's some good ones. <laughs> nice. Well, I will provide links to everything, to all this, so folks can find it easily. Awesome. And uh, awesome. dude, just thank you for talking to me. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it. Hey, no problem, man. Anytime. Long overdue, and um, yeah, for sure. Next time we'll we'll uh, get a little kinkier. I mean, this was pretty vanilla, bro. Of course, I know. You know, I don't want to shock people right off the bat. Um, but it's like a Maplethorpe over here, as I as I thought. So. You I'm have been fidgeting in your chair a lot. I figured there was something up there. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Yeah, that's me, Mr. Fidget. <laughs> well, folks, thanks for listening. Take care. Go seek out Dan's stuff, and we'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Hello, This is the Doom Show is a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network. Please check out the other podcasts on legionpodcasts.com. If you'd like more Hello, This is the Doom Show, go to Hello Doom Show dot dot com or go to doomedmoviethon.com for the archives. If that's still not